So yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Blank, and I'm a senior research data and intelligence analyst in the Credit Branches Engagement and Operations team. Uh, today, I'll be covering the recent July changes to the to the rules relating to affordability assessments, uh, the Commission's approach uh, enforcement approach to responsible lending breaches, and touch on some recent questions we have received from lenders around affordability assessments. So in March, MB, who are the lawmaker lawmakers made some initial changes to the new affordability regulations and code guidance which came into force on the 7th of July. These changes came from lenders feedback to MB about the effect on new, of the new laws on, the, on lending decisions, especially home loans. As you may be aware, there are a few more changes coming and these changes relate to the calculation of discretionary expenses, some credit card and buy now pay later payments, and consolidating of debts in, from other lenders. Public consultation on these changes closed on the 20th of October and MB are now considering the submissions. I won't speak about the, the latest set of potential changes, but would like to talk a little about the initial changes that took place in July. So as you know, the triple CFA and the new regulations combined prevent lenders from lending to borrowers in cash flow de deficit, which is causing substantial hardship. Like many of you who draw up bud budgets for clients as part of your role, lenders must complete their affordability assessments in a two-stage process. In stage one, they need to gather information about income and expenses in sufficient detail, and this is referred to as the initial estimate. In stage two, they must verify and adjust if some expenses appear to, be to be below a standard benchmark and check for missing expenses. So from July 2022, the regulations were amended to explicitly exclude saving, savings and investments from the definition of listed outgoings in the regulations. This means that lenders no longer need to include savings and investment payments by borrowers in their assessments of expenses, but they need to remember that where a borrower is saving for a particular expense, so for an example, a school uniform or car repairs, the expense itself will still need to be included in the expense assessment, just not the savings for it to avoid double counting. So lenders will need to be asking what any savings are for and not assume they are unallocated funds. The regulations have also been changed to make clear that lenders will need to ensure that they collect expense information from borrowers about individual expense topics rather than all in one bucket. So for example, they need to be asking how much is a borrower's accommodation, uh, their utilities, uh, transport and payments of debts and insurance. So this is opposed to what are the total debts or the total living expenses. So changes also took effect to the code also took effect in July. Keep in mind that the code is guidance only and lenders don't have to comply with it, but they must comply with the law and the regulations. For financial mentors, the code is useful for showing what responsible lending should look like in practice, but the lender can choose other ways to comply with the law. The code now provides additional guidance for the two-stage process. So once the lender has gathered all the information they need in stage one of the process, then stage two requires that lenders verify some of that information just in case those expenses are underestimated. The code also provides suggestions on how they do that, including the use of benchmarks. The commission has seen instances of lenders verifying almost all of the uh, borrower's expenses through the use of benchmarks. We note that not all expenses will be benchmarkable, such as expenses that can be based on statistical information, especially expenses the borrower, borrower is unwilling to give up. We caution lenders against trying to use bench, to benchmark all expenses in circumstances where bank statements would appear to be more appropriate to verify the borrower's actual expenditure. A benchmark expense is also defined and is in the glossary of the red, set, red flags resource that Lizanne provided the link to earlier. If you see the, these in the lender's affordability assessments and, they, and you think they appear to be on the low side, you can always ask the lender where they got their benchmark from. It is important to remember the role of the regulations and the code. They support the triple CFA and the regulations set up by the law, or in other words, exactly how lenders need to do what, they, what the law requires, which reduces the risk of wrong interpretations. The code, as mentioned earlier, provides guidance to help lenders comply with the triple CFA and the regulations. Finally, 
We were told we told lenders to be careful about an over reliance on payment history when granting additional credit. They still need to do an affordable affordability assessment for material changes or top ups. So, as you know, some people may prioritize loan repayments for going additional expenditure on food and other necessities. So now what I want to talk about is the sort of things that the Commission thinks about when considering a complaint and about a potential breach of responsible lending affordability obligations. There are a range of outcomes starting from taking no further action through to legal proceedings. Whether we decide to investigate or not is guided by a certain set of criteria. And if we do investigate, our decisions about the action that we take are made in accordance with our enforcement response guidelines, which are also available on our website. For complaints or notifications about a potential affordability of breaches, we consider what enforcement response to take using, and the key criteria that we consider are, firstly, the extent of harm, uh, where we consider what happened to the borrower after they got the loan. Is there evidence that the borrower suffered substantial hardship? Just because the borrower isn't defaulted on the loan doesn't mean that they have suffered uh, hardship. So borrowers will typically prioritize their mortgage and car payments and may end up with insufficient funds to pay for necessities like food and power. We also look at the total number of borrowers that have been affected and are more concerned if the borrowers are particularly vulnerable for any reason. So for an example, a uh, the borrower's English may be their second language or they may need to be desperate for the funds when they applied for the loan. Secondly, we also look into how serious the is the conduct. Is the breach of a result of an individual's employee's mistake? or due to a major system failure and negligence. Were, so for an example, were reasonable steps taken to do the affordability assessment? Was there no assessment done at all? Or is it somewhere in the middle? When looking at how serious the conduct is, we also look at things like, how did the borrower default on the loan? Or is there a pattern for the lender? Or is this just a one-off? And how quickly did the lender fix their failure? There's something for you to keep in mind when working with lenders. We would like to, to know about instances where you've brought a problem to a lender's attention through, our complaint, through your complaints to them, and little or nothing has been done to fix what appears to be a serious issue with the lender's systems, policies, or processes. Uh, we also consider the wider public interest. So has the commission previously dealt with the same issue before with the same lender, or is the problem widespread and likely affect the wider population with a particular industry? So what I thought I'd do next is just touch on a couple of recent queries. So the Commission um, continues to receive questions from consumer advisors and lenders about the interpretation of the Act and regulations. While we do not provide legal advice and are unable to provide advice tailored to a specific lender or situation or an advocate's client, we can provide some guidance and we do encourage questions. The questions we receive help us inform about the public guidance we may be able to provide that can assist advocates exercising their rights and lenders in complying with the law. So there is a question that we have received recently from a lender that I believe that may be of interest to you. So the lender asked, when our benchmarkable expenses are based on Statistics New Zealand Household Economic Survey data, how often do we need to consider revising the benchmark figures? And can we still rely on data from 2019 and 2020 given the rise in inflation? So this is a really good question considering the rise of cost of living right now. So under the regulations, as part of the stage two process, lenders have the option to verify benchmarkable expenses through the use of benchmarks. As mentioned earlier, these are only for the types of expenses that statistical data can provide averages for. The regulations set out some rules around benchmarks that must be based on robust, uh, robust statistical methodo methodology. So for an example, how Statistics New Zealand might go about setting a benchmark. Mender lenders making up benchmarks for their own internal data could run into issues. The benchmark must be recent and it must be reasonable to use in, in the circumstances, meaning it has to reflect the borrower's likely relevant expenses. In terms of benchmark, like the HES 2019 and 2020 data, we caution against using them blindly. Um, and so what do we mean by that? So we think that responsible lenders should consider individual benchmark, benchmark amounts before using them. And this consideration is consistent with benchmark requirements. So th these lenders need to consider, the things that lenders need to consider include, if the benchmark is for food, 
and has the general cost of food risen since this last statistical information was published? So we can say that as a definite yes. So we would expect an increase in the food benchmark amounts, which haven't been set as recently as this year to be taken into account. Another thing that we would, we would advise them to consider is the ben benchmark recent enough. If there's a more recent benchmark, we are probably going to ask the lender why they have not chose to use that one. So if the benchmark is $100 for food, but the lender knows for, from experience that it should be 150, then we should expect them to use the $150 one. We also remind the lenders benchmarks are not a safe haven. And as part of the verification assessment, they must take the higher of the benchmark or the initial expense estimate. As mentioned earlier, if you're concerned about a lender is using a benchmark that is out of date or completely out of sync with reality, then don't be afraid to question it and ask where it came from. The regulations say benchmarks need to be recent and reasonable to use in these circumstances. Another important thing that the Commission looks at when at the way lenders use benchmarks, we aren't going to be scrutinizing them down to the granular dollar. We look at the whole picture. So whether the benchmark is out by a couple of dollars isn't something that we're likely to hold against the lender. But if they're using 10 benchmarks and they're all out by $20 or more, then that, and that's going to impact on the borrower's overall position. So we might look a little bit more closely at those ones. The Commission also gets a lot of questions about what a reasonable, what we consider is a reasonable surf for us or buffer is. Under the regulations, a lender must be satisfied on reasonable grounds that it is likely the borrower will make the payments under the agreement without suffering substantial hardship because the borrower's likely income exceeds the relevant expenses and there is one or both a, of a reasonable surplus or a reasonable buffers or adjustments included in the expense estimates. The regulations require lenders to include a surplus or buffers to allow for overestimations or income or underestimations of expenses. The reasonable surplus or buffer is not prescribed in the regulations as a specific dollar amount or a percentage. The Responsible Lending Code contains guidance about buffers, surpluses and adjustments, but basically lenders need to provide uh, for either buffers or surpluses. However, the overall result needs to be some money left over from income minus expenses after the new loan payment is included. Despite the, despite the code guidance, there is no exact figure like a number or a percentage. It's about a lender making a responsible decision on the borrower's circumstances. So the commission can't provide any solid figures, but we understand that some there that some more guidance on what a reasonable surplus or buffer is would likely be valuable for, to both advocates and lenders. What we can say is that we're continuing to work in this space. Uh, we have a couple of monitoring projects planned over the next financial year, and our hope is that we'll be able to provide some practical examples through those projects. So continue to watch this space, and thank you for your time today, and I hope the information provided here has been useful to you.